Settle in class, I've looked madness in the mouth, and today I'm gonna share. This is not my usual kind of video, but we've just hit our one year anniversary. So as a present, I'm gonna drag you into the madness I've been trying to claw out of in my off time. Never said who the gift was for. Back in the beginning, when I thought I was gonna be a lore channel, I got sucked into a whirlpool of elf varieties and lore. Wound up deciding to do classes instead, but since we've been at this a year now, I figured I'd emerge with my findings. And trust me, you don't know how many elves there are. You do know what an elf is though, right? At least you think? Humanoid worships a pickle pantheon called the Seldarine. They live for 700 years or so, but you can kind of argue that they never fully die. There is an exact amount of elven souls that exist, endlessly reincarnated. Instead of sleeping, an elf goes into a nightly trance, visions of their previous lives flashing before their eyes. They're generally not considered a full adult until they've gone through all of them. So when I start going into the atrocities committed by a particular sub-race in elves, and no, I am not talking about the drow, remember that if any species should be able to learn from their history, it's the elves. Sadly, step one of learning from your mistakes involves admitting that you've made them to begin with. Anyway, this is going to be a big one again, so let's go. Way back about 32,000 years ago, a moon filled with dragon eggs was thrown into the planet during an event called the Tearfall. The crater merged entire seas together, and so the Sea of Stars was born. This was around the time the giants were born, and they immediately went to war. After a few thousand years of stalemate among their own kingdoms, Bay Portal started opening up and spitting out various elves. Initial scouts like Dark and Wild Elves carved out a place for themselves among the dragons, but eventually Gold Elves showed up and decided it was time to kick them out. Ever since, more and more types of elf keep being created. The greatest service that Bybee has done is hold back this endless tide of elven species, mashing some together and conveniently forgetting about others. There's around 8 released in modern books, well over 20 if you include ones from the past, and at least 30 if you're petty like me and count things like the Drider. I'll try to focus on the main ones unless there's a really interesting story, but I need to at least mention how many there were because I refuse to let them live that down. They get onto humans and goblins for being everywhere you look, but there is no surface on this or any plane that is safe from elven kind. I'm joking, of course. The sky and astral elves prove we're not safe even without surfaces. Now let's get this started with the High Elves, because there are so many that they need extra groupings. I'll ease you in with the one you're most likely to encounter, the Moon Elf. Also known as a Silver Elf, they're impulsive and love traveling, often joining groups of adventurers. Their culture values kindness and diversity in friendship. Don't get me wrong, for all the love of joy and revelry, they'll still kill you dead if you're an enemy, but they're some of the most humble and tolerant of elves. They're the first in line to advocate that maybe the Intel Kess aren't worthless idiots. Oh, um, sorry, Intel Kess is the elven word for all other sentient species. It means not people. Other elves often consider them naive or childish, for thinking interaction with other species might be a good thing. The not people have strengths to offer. Just look at the humans and gnomes and even halflings. Most of the other elves are worried about them getting shanked. Some elves in particular keep lecturing them like children about how elitism is for their own good. And stop thinking your goddess isn't equal. She's just our patron's consort. However, the moon elves do not care. That's why they paired among the best over the years. Turns out there actually is something to be said for not looking down on your neighbors. Funnily enough, the exact other end of the spectrum is the gray elves. They actually they look similar, but confusing silver and gray is basically a slur. I'd be offended too. They consider everything else to be inferior forms of life, even the other elves, and won't tolerate a non-elf so as to not taint the purity of their bloodline. Many other elves are technically allowed near, but everyone just actively chooses to avoid them. I mean, they aren't evil, they're just magical jerks that don't value freedom with strict monarchy in a caste system. But don't worry, they have servants, not slaves. Although the other elves tend to consider them slaves, because even if they can technically leave, they've had all their joy and will to live drained. I don't know whether to disagree with that because that just sounds like customer service, or entirely agree with it because that sounds like customer service. Anyway, leaping from one isolationist to another, we have the Star Elves. Light skin, hair of red or gold or silver, and that's most of what we know because they're even reclusive toward other elves. Lived in peace for 5,000 years, and then get attacked by humans, and then by orcs. And then they saw a new nation rising up and decided to make their own demiplane and just run. Really cool place, a twilight world of silver woods, got found and attacked by by alien aberrations from the ethereal plane. Which is why I even bother mentioning them. The Star Elves just have the worst knock. Imagine ripping a hole in reality to form a world for yourself, only for a collective of horrors from the land of dream and nightmare to decide they're going to hunt you. They even went so far as to buy every Star Elf relic from every market for millennia in hopes of finding any useful info. Because they just hate them for no discernible reason. Though speaking of High Elves with just terrible luck, we have the Luir, a moon and wild elf combo that turned into its own subspecies during their 11,000 years of being stranded on the Moonche Isles. They crashed while playing some gold elves that just killed their leaders and more. You will learn why in the drow section. Nature-loving and magical vegetarians, they believe trouts represent the spirits of their ancestors. And yeah, they don't care about the elven pantheon. They revere fey spirits just like the old days, like the Arkbay they're allied with. They even get along fine with the local dwarves. They've really got that moon elf diversity going on. In fact, they only really dislike people that actively harmed or oppressed them like the sun elves. I gave them their own main spot because I just want to hear more about them. They 
up dwarves fight in a war of the gods against a giant intelligent shape-shifting divine Tyrannosaurus Rex and his army of giant kin, with the aid of a reincarnating whale, a unicorn, and the wolves. All of them. Their adventures are cool, they sound nice, and I want more. Now you might be wondering who these sun and gold elves I keep mentioning are. Well, I made them the last of the high elves out of spite. Sun elves are also called gold elves, or as they call it, superior. They're practically a parody. It'd honestly be funny if they didn't keep committing war crimes over it. You think that elves consider themselves better than everyone? Well, sun elves have a list of where all the other elven subspecies stand underneath them. You think elves are slow to act but talented? Sun elves are overly patient by elven standards, insisting on mastering a skill before they ever really apply it. Perfection is the minimum allowed. Can't let others mistakenly think they're capable of fault. Speaking of which, do you think elves are magic? Elven high magic can affect even a god, and sun elves are usually the first to use it, even against other elves. I could go on with things like the Dark Disaster and First Sundry, but I'll cover some of their crimes in a moment. As you might have noticed, you can barely mention an elf without talking about what the gold elves think of them or what they've done to them, so I won't spend much more time on their solo section. For now, just remember that they consider themselves first above all, inheritors of their chief god and divinely mandated protectors of their lessers. They are very serious about that designation and proud of who they are. It's not uncommon for them to have their lineage traced back over 12,000 years to prove their nobility. They are obsessed with that bloodline and always trying to strengthen it. At one point, even trying demon blood just made the fairy half demons who immediately wanted to take over the old empire. Way to go. Now, I'm not saying that individual elves or communities can't be different. They definitely can. However, general sun elf culture for tens of thousands of years was just thinking that you're better than anything short of a god and quietly considering your kind to be the only real and proper elf, unless you're a part of the old empire, in which case you think that you're better than the gods. But we will get to them. Anyway, the one exception to that superiority complex are the aquatic elves, also known as sea elves who they decided are the sun elves of the water and therefore pretty much equal. Which is weird given they're the least magical elf and even look the most different. Bigger and bulkier with all sorts of colors on their unusually thick skin. Even if Watsi's too cowardly to show it. According to the sun elves, it's because they bring civilization to the sea and preserve traditional elven culture. Just like a proper sun elf. Though personally I think it was just the only way that their ego could handle being worse at swimming. Because sea elves aren't colonizers. And as for tradition, the other elves just confuse them. Because their communities are very tightly knit. Trustworthy allies save lives, while bickering about superiority gets you killed. Better to be a reclusive yet loyal friend to your local merfolk and triton, because there's always a bigger fish. Trusting their fellow elves doesn't mean they trust other surface races though. No matter how curious they are about them, their bitter rivals are the Sawagan, aggressive shark people who can make evil sea elf clones to infiltrate and destroy them. So of course they try to wipe out the shark people, which means they're in the same area, which means that surface dwellers have been expecting any fish person to be a bloodthirsty shark cultist raider and attack. In general though, they're really really kind people. Well, except for the morale. A subspecies with glowing eyes consisting of one town of 2,000. They were cursed for ignoring a divine command to help the city of North Deep against an invading army, given it was attacked by an army of 40,000 led by a great worm. I can't really blame them. That was a suicide mission. They weren't going to come back from that one. Now they attack anything that gets too close. They just want to be left alone. They also abandoned the god that cursed them for Umberly, deity of the sea's wrath, and she is the entire reason I bothered to mention them, because otherwise I don't know if I'm going to get the chance to mention how two of her titles are The Bitch Queen and The Sea Bitch. That's not even a joke. The official Book of Songs dedicated to her is called Shanties for the Bitch Queen. And her primary worshippers are just scared sailors and kraken cultists. She's petty, vain, malicious, and probably why Bolo's guide only has like two sea creatures, one of which is made to drag people back to sea. Bolo annoyed her once and she will not let it go. Attacks him anytime he gets on a boat. We don't even know how. Probably called her The Sea Bitch. Sorry, I couldn't learn this and not share it. Just like you couldn't learn it without sharing it right after you like and subscribe. <laughs> oh, who am I kidding? You aren't gonna share this? I'm honestly shocked you even made it this far. Really happy though. It means a lot. I hope my ramblings bring you joy. The last category you probably think of are the wood elves, also known as copper elves. They're protectors of nature, and even the gold elves respect their calmness and sense of duty to the forest. They came from intermingling refugees from the wars that ruined the old empires. However, they're determined to learn from the mistakes of their ancestors. Don't build towers and walls, they just collapse. Don't bother with magic. Your silly little words won't dominate this world for long. And don't get caught by monogamy of love or worship. Every relationship should be free to rise and fall. Possessiveness is not a good luck. The trappings of civilization are fleeting. What doesn't have to fade is compassion and humility. And lacking it for other races is what doomed their old ways. They don't even have nobility. They're held together by councils of elders being advised by local druids. Oh, and as a quick aside, the wild or green elf is either a xenophobic wood elf subculture or an entirely different subspecies. Just depends on the curriculum. It's currently back to being a subculture, but no matter what, they're nomadic survivalists. 
Pirates. They lean toward Ranger, Druid, and Barbarian, but they're fine with anything that can pick up and leave quickly. They're pretty isolationist, even avoiding other elves, the exception being the aforementioned Star Elves and the Lithari, which often used to be Wild Elves. And what's a Lithari? Well, they're like a werewolf, but they're an elf, so just so much better. Don't worry, they can only transfer the transformation if both parties want to, and they're really peaceful, and normal wolves sent them into the pack no problem, and oh, they're just so naturally good that evil things automatically sense it and run away, and everybody likes them. Meh. I know the modern books have decided they're just fake werewolves with main character syndrome, but they're always elves and traditionally were their own thing, so I'm counting it. They were among the first to arrive after all, the scouts before the elven flood. Speaking of a natural scout that showed up at the beginning, and a stall since I know you'll click off once I've covered the edgy ones, I gotta mention the Avaril, elves with pretty wings and great singing voices. Children spend time with both the warrior and the scholar culture, so they can understand each other no matter where they end up. They also made a full body sign language to communicate during flight. I love these ones. Too bad they were basically wiped out by the dragons like 26,000 years ago during a Draco rage. Elf and high magic bound power to a comet, the King Keller Star. Anytime it appeared, every dragon would lose control of themselves in a mindless rage. They'd forget their magic and start killing every non-dragon they knew and loved. Didn't matter how strong they were or good they were. Everyone would fall to madness eventually. Even Wish could only protect you for a day. They did start to make spells that could hold it off a bit near the end, assuming you weren't too close to the place that maintained the spell, but it could last for weeks or months, and depending on your region, it might come back every few decades. This kept going for 26,000 years, with the magic being cast and protected by elven kind. The winged elves were destroyed as part of a combined army defending it. Now, I don't really blame them. Evil dragons seemed to target them specifically. They were just trying to survive, but later elves could have stopped him once the dragons weren't a threat anymore. And trust me, stopping this was not for lack of trying. You ever notice how the moon has a chunk taken out of it? The dragons got so desperate to stop being forced to kill everyone, they made a giant magic anti-orbital laser and tried to shoot it down. They missed, grazed the moon, blasted off a chunk, and caused a giant goblin war. For what? We didn't know what was going on. We saw the asteroids made the sky brighter and decided that the humans must be trying to make more moons to see us with. We may have panicked a little, but Anyway, the elves hijacked the minds of everything draconic for 26,000 years, forcing them to try and kill everything other than dragons that they saw, including elves. I admit that I am biased, but I take pleasure in reminding them that their plans aren't always perfect or good. Someone has to, the dark elves can't anymore, and good luck wiping the goblins out over it. Better than you have tried. Okay, fine, no more putting off the dark elves. Now I could keep talking about ones that live in like one area, like the dusk elves of Barovia, or the ancient Mariloi of Karatur, but we'll move past the valley elves and painted and snow, it's time we get into the second most edgy type of elf, the drow and their infinite offshoots. But we can't get into them without talking about their creation, the ones who cast the ultimate magic that warped them into what they are. Believe it or not, it was the gnomes. Look, I know this is turning into a hit piece on gold elves, but this time even the gods admit it. So buckle in, because this is what made me realize I had to write this script. Way, way back, tens of thousands of years ago, the gold elves began to hatch a plan. You see, a small section of dark elves in one country had started to worship an evil god. Therefore, all dark elves of all faiths and countries needed to be abandoned. The good elves would spend 300 years on a ritual to create Evermeet, an island paradise ripped out of their heaven and thrown into the sea, complete with divine approval and help. However, there were naysayers. Scholars remember that while even some animals understand basic water displacement, this was the gold elves they were talking about at one of the heights of their arrogance. So they reminded everyone that their high magic usually causes mass destruction. This was not going to end well. They wanted to fulfill a prophecy and make a haven for all the children of God, but they only came here because they already destroyed their own land with high magic. Only 50 elves got out of there alive, only one of which was a silver elf. They nearly wiped them all out. The gold elves responded by yelling fake news and banned all dark elves from their chunk of heaven forever. But nobody could predict how bad this would get. The continent shattered and magic itself began to rip apart as the fabric of reality bunched and tore. Even with the elven gods helping damage control, thousands were killed. It ripped through time in ways we still don't fully know. And when they finally emerged from the hundreds of destroyed cities, with the war turning out to be valid, the surviving gold elves decided to continue excluding them from their new haven. They built a new and improved center of elven civilization, the gold elf empire of Arvindar, and a wedge was formed between them. Don't think they were done though. After 10,000 years of building and repopulating, there were quite a few elven nations, but Arvindar eventually became so arrogant they started attacking the other 
elven kingdoms. No more letting other nations think they were equal. They were superior. Ruling over others was their divine right, and if others wouldn't bow, they would prove it. It was time for colonialism, starting with Mayuritar, a 5,000-year-old nation of dark and green elves explicitly made to escape Arvindar and their politics. They were the center of power for Unistrae, the dark elf goddess of life, dancing, hunting, and freedom. Remember that while they're the first to be subjugated, but for Elithir, the first elven kingdom and the main base of the dark elves since before the gold elves showed up, this was the final straw. The empire was going to let those people go, and if the countries between them wanted to stop them, they would come to regret it. The gold elves kept invading. Dark elves carved paths of burning destruction through anyone giving them support. Arbandar fully conquered Meiritar. Elithir resorted to undead and started enslaving monsters. And then one day, Meiritar was gone. By which I mean a multiple month ultimate tornado of elven high magic turned the whole forest nation into a wasteland, and the magical radiation is just now beginning to clear up. It may have destroyed any evidence of who did it, but most people agree on who it was. On top of the obvious reasons like centuries of military occupation, Arbandar had spent the last 400 years working with Malkizid, a fallen angel who'd been banished for trying to kill their god. They had spent so much time with him they'd even built a few homes in hell, where they hopefully stayed eventually. But regardless of who or what or why, Emlithir went berserk. This was now officially what they had feared, a war for their species survival. And oh, were they gonna go down fighting. The priestesses of Loth, the traitor god, are offering a demon army. Go ahead, you can lead. The oldest evil, that which lurks, wants to help. Just like old times, join the fun. They bathed everything in flame, and that was all Arvindar needed. Ignore how Arvindar was secretly also using the fiendish might of a traitor. At this point, their very name was the word for traitor, Drow. The chief god Corellan funneled his power through the priests and mages, and every dark elf forever became what they are now. And I mean all of them. Refugees of the storm, people from other countries or planes. It didn't matter if you were still praying to him for salvation. You were now a drow. And they weren't just transformed. They were barred from heaven, cut from their god, and made so that even the sun itself would weaken them. Even their visions from old lives were gone. And looked like reincarnation was off the table now. Within two months, they were driven into the Underdark. And they nearly went feral. The goddess who would normally guide them and willingly left the pantheon to protect them couldn't really do much with all of her clergy vaporized. Despite the High Court of the Gods declaring peace, Arbandar immediately returned to subjugating all the other elves, and spent centuries hunting down high mages and clergy to make sure that even the gods couldn't fight back this time. So the Pantheon called another court of elves, who declared that Arbandar was at fault for these 3,000 years of war. Arbandar responded that they weren't capable of fault, and declared war on everyone. And so all the elven empires fell. Now do not get me wrong, Loth is one of the most involved evil deities of all, weeding out anything good she can from her civilizations personally. She honestly doesn't even care about any of her stated goals of revenge. She just finds torturing the drow to be the most delightful thing in the world. Just remember that most were driven to this path, thinking it the only way to survive. A lot of them didn't even have a choice. And even the evils of the ones in the Underdark are often from ignorance and fear of a goddess who makes sure she's all they ever know. They don't actually know their other gods anymore, because all the others call them to rebel and free themselves. Now, all that said, the Dark Elf cities of the Underdark are far worse than I could ever describe on this channel. Everything you've ever heard about them being torture loving slavers who treat men like cattle is honestly just the tip of the iceberg. They've also got so many entries on that species list. Half demon Dracoloth with two different forms. Four types of half dragon. Loth grabbing people in the middle of the night and forcing them into a trial. And if they can't win, they turn into all sorts of creatures, like Drider or Spider Leg Horrors. You're then cast out for being weak enough to need help, alongside all the other people that Loth transformed into random creatures just because she could. And forget half drow, try the half half elf half drow Krinti a hybrid that are counted so long as they are one 32nd drow. Now you see their true evil, all the record keeping they're making us do. But their evil is finally starting to turn around. It may have taken over 9,000 years, but the goddess of good in this trae has finally rebuilt. There's finally enough followers to get some of her old power back, and one even managed to revert hundreds into dark elves and bust them back into heaven. Which I suppose is why they felt the need to go darker yet darker. Yeah, that's right. Remember, I called the drow second edgiest. Last of any real renown, it's time for what I call the planar elves. Not what those warlocks of the Wharf Column, just me. These are the ones infused with outside energy. Keeping with the edgy theme, we have the Shadar Kai. You see, the Shadowfell realized their whole making things edgy bit was already taken. Drow, Drider, multiple half demons, two different types of part shadow dragon alone. Their solution was to turn the dial up until it broke, then try to stab someone with it. You really only need to know one thing. If you see them, just turn around. It's not worth it. I don't care if your quest was to save the world. The world deserves it for letting these escape. And it's not even the soulless edge, though it's a very 
parody of a parody. Emotionless unless watching others die or remembering mortality. Beautiful unless you see them in shadow which shows them as corpse-like. Ignoring useless things like comfort and morality. Ghostly white with jet black hair. Entirely black eyes without pupils or whites. And her shadows are like darker than shadows and lash out when they're moody. Born of the Raven Queen, known for working with the Skull Dragon Despair to corrupt magic in the Shadow Swamp, which is basically the mirror of dead men but even edgier. And always covered in tattoos and piercings and anything else that would scare an old businessman or suburban mom from the 50s. You know, I should probably start getting to the edgy part. The thing is, that's not what I hate most. What annoys me is the design. These are a good example of what I like to call Watsy's Special Elves. You see this CR7 creature? Bonus action teleport with extra speed and reach and deals damage like a demon lord. And the CR11 version? 45 damage AoE that deals exhaustion levels and abilities like Weight of Ages and Soul Drinker. And ignoring the fact that by their own classification they're the wrong CR. Because I know that some of you are already typing never look at the CR. Well fine, their stats say that every fight will end in one round. You either cornered and killed them on turn two or they've already killed all your casters and are well out of your range. It's just not good. On the flip side though, you get the Eldrin. They're fey elves, changing between seasonal forms and emotional whims. Whims that give them entirely different abilities. Whether it's extra strength, their fire damage, new spells, all sorts of cool stuff. Sure, they're a little over the top, but they're the fey elves. Potentially the original one. I'm not gonna knock them. Let them be moody, they're fey. I'd be disappointed if they weren't. Though I do need to clarify, I'm talking about the fey Eldrin, as technically high elves are common Eldrin, and you know what? That's enough. That's more than enough. But I had to share this descent into madness with with you, which I fell prey to at the beginning of this channel's life. That is the only reason I've made this. It's been plaguing me for a year and I had to share. And here I thought I'd just make something quick. Well, I have three thoughts on this. One is that groups of gold elves keep almost killing the world. I've only touched on the atrocities they've committed. Their pantheon signed off on or helped with most of this. And they're supposed to be among the goodest of all gods. How? Is the standard really that low? Or maybe Watsy just has an elf kink. Anyway, number two, aren't you glad it practically takes divine intervention for goblins to declare a new species? I swear you can't turn around without finding another elf. Despite their species aging and reproducing the slowest, it doesn't add up. And finally, did you notice the date this was posted? It's been one year since you looked at me, and I will forever be grateful. Over 700 of you. Despite how inconsistent my episodes are, I'm not the best and I can't promise much, but I can say that I'll keep trying new things and at least keep attempting to improve. But this is where the most observant of you are expecting that musical parody I've been teasing for like five months. Yeah, so was I. I've got six hours of from three different days. I even had a fake argument with my camera guy worked out as an intro. Say hi, Sigbert. <sighs> but every instrumental you can license for the Wellerman is the abridged version. And apparently I'm also just not good at acapella mixes. I kept dealing psychic damage to myself from the quality and the lack of confidence just led to a feedback loop until I had to stop for my mental health. I love to sing, but some other time, sorry. Anyway, I've got an extra little bit on today's outro. Now, as always, I'd like to thank Barrel Goblin and Sergeant Daniels for their many months of support. But today I'd also like to give a special thanks to Level 1 cleric for supporting me from day one before I even had videos and you too masquerade if you're watching and of course an extra special thanks to you from the friends I've known for years to the viewers who have already unsubbed here's to the channel's birthday and many more bye I'm slowly losing power has it only been an hour that can't be right <laughs>